Matt's Chat is brought to you by Walters. Walters is the best sports bar in Navy Yard, located just across the street from Nationals Park. Also a great place to check out if you're headed to Audi Field. Make sure to check out their self-pour beer wall and unlimited TVs. Whether you're a world-class athlete or a podcaster like me, we all understand the importance of mental and physical well-being and proper recovery for top-notch performance. That's why I'm excited that Unified Healing is sponsoring podcasts on the Blue Wire Network. Unified Healing is a new and super innovative global network of wellness centers powered by Energy Enhancement System, or EE System. If you haven't heard of the EE System yet, then you'll want to listen up. This technology promotes wellness, deep relaxation, purification, and rejuvenation. Wherever you are across the globe, access to a center is easy and affordable. Interested in experiencing the EE System technology for yourself? Go to unifiedhealing.com slash bluewire to learn more and find a center near you. That's unified, U-N-I-F-Y-D, healing.com slash blue wire. No material or testimonials on the Unified Healing website are intended to be viewed as medical advice or a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition or treatment and before undertaking a new healthcare regimen, including EE system. Two pitch, swing and a miss. And Trevor Williams strikes out the side here in the fourth inning. This ball hit by Gallo, ripped into right field for a base hit. Rayleigh charges, around third is Ruiz. Here comes the throw to the plate and he is saved! Cal Raleigh took the throw, dove back toward the plate to try and tag Ruiz. K-Bear slides to the outside part of the plate. Dan Bellino rules him safe. They look into the dugout to see if the Mariners want a challenge. And it looks like they will not. Pitch swung on line drive, one up. Fielded by Abrams, plenty of time. Throw it up first to Gallo. And a curly W's in the books. Kyle Finnegan gets it done with a 1 2 3 ninth inning and has his 14th save in 16 tries for the year. And welcome to Nats Chat for Sunday, May 26, 2024, along with MassInSports.com Nationals insider Mark Zuckerman. I'm Al Galdi, host of the Al Galdi podcast. Well, when you have pitching that is great, your offense only need be good enough. And sure enough, the Nats pitching right now is great. Another extremely well-pitched game on Saturday, a 3-1 win over the American League West leading Seattle Mariners at Nationals Park in game two of a three-game series. The Nats for this regular season now 23 and 27. This installment of the Nats Chat podcast is brought to us by Cape Ivy, a DC area charity that has donated over 18,000 ponchos to keep kids warm. Visit capeivy.org for more information. Mark, the pitching for this Nats team continues to be so good. And you combine that with just enough timely hitting. And on Saturday, some savvy managing. And uh, the Nats are on the verge of a three-game sweep of a division-leading team in Seattle on this Memorial Day weekend. Not too bad. Not too bad at all. The first two games of this series, you almost couldn't draw it up much better than how it's played out for them. I mean, sure, you'd love to score a few more runs and not have to rely on manufacturing those last couple late in the game. But the pitching has been outstanding. The hitting has come through when they've needed it. The bullpen has been lights out as it has been really for some time now. And yeah, I want to get into whether we do it right off the top or at some point in the show. I want to get into the managing in this game because I think Davey Martinez schooled Scott Service in this game and was as big a part of the Nationals winning this game as anybody who actually played this game. Yeah, we're certainly going to get to that. I feel like, though, when Trevor Williams, 10 starts into his season, has an ERA of uh, 229, we probably <laughs> should continue to lead with that. He has been so good, and it has been so nice to see him do what he's doing. And you combine that with a bullpen performance that was nearly flawless on Saturday. And boy, this Nats pitching is just on fire right now. So Trevor Williams in this 3-1 win, one run, five innings, eight strikeouts, no walks. This was not a game in which, you know, he was one run in five innings, but he gave up a bunch of hits and he issued walks and he barely struck out any guys and the peripherals were not too impressive. No, this was a really good outing by Williams. One run, five innings, eight Ks, no walks. He gave up five hits, which were a solo homer, a double, and three singles. He threw a lot of strikes, and yet another instance of an ad starting pitcher here lately, throwing a ton of strikes, 85 pitches, 56 strikes, 29 balls. He gave up the homer. The last batter he faced, he gave up the double. 
Davey did his thing of five innings. He gives up the double. You get him out. 85 pitches. You get him out. But the Trevor Williams train continues to run. We are now just about at the point at which he started to fall off the cliff last season. So we'll see what happens these next few months. But you cannot say enough good things about what this guy is doing. You look at his stats now for this regular season. 10 starts, ERA at 229. The whip is at 1.08 and maybe as significant as anything Two home runs, 51 innings. The homer he gave up on Saturday, just the second homer that he's allowed here. Just remarkable. Absolutely remarkable. And the consistency here, every start that he's making. Okay, you said 10 starts. He has not given up more than three runs in any of them. He's only given up one or zero earned runs in seven of the 10 starts. So we're not just talking about, well, He's just keeping them in the game. No, he is winning games for them. I know he doesn't necessarily get the official win because the lineup hasn't necessarily scored for him while he's still in the game, but he is winning games the way he is pitching. And what stands out to me, and I think we saw it in this one, maybe more than any game that he's played so far, that he's pitched so far, he's getting strikeouts and he's doing it with his fastball, even though he has, honestly, one of the slowest fastballs of any starter in the majors. And it is remarkable to see. He had eight strikeouts in the game, matching his career high. And I counted six of them coming on fastballs, fastballs that topped out at 90 miles an hour. His four seamer in this game averaged 88.5 and topped out at 90.3. And yet he's able to get swings and misses up in the zone with it. And it's a really good lesson in pitching and pitching smart. And he explained some of it afterwards, recognizing, first of all, what Mackenzie Gore did the previous night and what they could exploit about the Mariners lineup. But number two, you get them looking down, down, down and off speed and slow stuff. And all of a sudden you can fire an 89 mile an hour fastball up in the zone and it looks a lot harder. It catches them off guard. They're not ready for it and it can make them look silly. And so even though he's not throwing Mackenzie Gore throws, He's still blowing away hitters with fastballs with two strikes. That's a remarkable thing to see and such an incredible development for him based on what we saw last year. He is second among guys in the Nats rotation here this regular season in strikeouts per nine innings. Mackenzie Gore is number one and Trevor Williams is number two. He is averaging more strikeouts per nine innings than Jake Irvin is averaging then Mitchell Parker is averaging by the slightest of margins, 7.59 to 7.58, but it is more. And Williams is averaging more strikeouts per nine innings than Patrick Corbin is averaging. But boy, is that a stunner. <laughs> Trevor Williams is second among Nats starters in strikeouts per nine innings here. You know, I know Josiah Gray's been out for a while, but still, that really is remarkable. And the lack of home runs, I mean, we've talked about that, but you cannot overstate this. He gave up the most homers among any pitcher in the National League for the 2023 regular season. And here he is, two home runs allowed the entirety of this regular season. It's hard to recall something like this, a guy making that big of a transformation from one season to the next. I know he's talked about it some, but I feel like we can't emphasize this enough that that which was his biggest problem last season has been arguably his biggest strength this season. It is amazing. And all the credit to him for recognizing what he wasn't doing well last year and going about trying to make it better. This was both physically really getting into a good workout routine over the course of the winter, but it's also just preparation and studying opposing hitters and understanding what can you do and understanding from his own stuff, what worked and what didn't work. And he keeps saying, I was getting beaten too often last year on like my fourth best pitch. Well, you got to be smarter about it. Throw pitches that you're confident in, throw them where you know they can be successful. And he's done such a good job of that. Like I said, keeping a lot of stuff down in the zone, of course, makes a big difference. But understanding you can still get him with fastballs up in the zone to the right hitters and in the right counts, I think that's made all the difference for him. And I, you know, I feel like we we keep saying after every one of these starts, well, maybe this will be the one when it all ends and uh, he's finally going to go back to being the Trevor Williams that we saw last year. Not to say that it can't still happen because, of course, it could. But I feel like we're moving a little past that point now, and it's not dreading the inevitable collapse. And more thinking to ourselves, well, maybe he can keep this going a little while longer. And boy, what an unexpected development that would be. 
Well, I think these next few weeks are key because, like I said, this is last season when he started to tail off. If he puts together a June like he has had in April and May, then I think it's time to say, all right, maybe this guy's just having a really good season. And it is important to remember, yes, he ended up being wretched last season, but he was good in the 2022 season. It's not like this guy has some horrible track record. Like, no, he hasn't been great. And, you know, he's been a combo starter reliever, but the guy has had some good seasons. So it's not unthinkable that he could be in the midst of a good season. And in this case, right now, he's in the midst of an excellent season. I I give Trevor Williams a ton of credit. And like we've talked about, Jim Hickey, Sean Doolittle deserve a lot of credit for what we're seeing here. And then the Nats bullpen in this 3-1 win over the Mariners on Saturday. Four Nats relievers combined for four scoreless, hitless, and walkless innings. And I say it that way because Hunter Harvey issued a hit by pitch. Other than that, the bullpen was flawless here. Robert Garcia, top of the six, faced three batters and got three outs. He came into the game with a runner on second, no outs, game tied at one. He retired each of the three batters he faced. As at least the last few outings here, Garcia has done a good job in terms of inherited runners. Dylan Floro continued to be so good this season. He tossed a perfect top of the seventh. Hunter Harvey tossed a scoreless, hitless, and walkless top of the eighth. He did issue a two-out hit by pitch. And then Kyle Finnegan, a perfect top of the ninth for the save. The Floro appearance included a spectacular defensive play by C.J. Abrams. I don't know about you. This, to me, is one of the best defensive plays this season by a Nats player. This might be number one. This was sensational. Abrams in the top of the seventh. Two balls, two strikes. Floro into the line and the pitch. France swings, hits it toward the middle. Abrams diving to his left from his knees, bounces it. Gallo picks it out at first base. Put a star next to that one, C.J. Abrams. And then from both of his knees, made a two-hop throw to first base for the out. What a job by Abrams on that play, and what a job by the Nats bullpen. Yeah, I'm trying to think of any other plays that would compare to that one this year. It's right up there, like you said. The athleticism to get to the ball and then to be able to make the throw while not having any kind of leverage at all to put anything on the ball. Fantastic play by him. He has been very good. Luis Garcia, I think, has made tremendous strides at second base, especially on those plays to his left where he has to make the sliding play and then throw to first has been outstanding. Boy, it makes a difference for them when when they have that kind of clean play up the middle. Robert Garcia comes in after Williams gives up the leadoff double. And the idea is, well, he's going to face lefties here. That's why you make the move. He ends up only facing one lefty out of the three guys, and he struck out both right-handed hitters. So that worked out fantastically for him and for the team and good for him for being able to do that. Dylan Flora, we're up to 21 and two-thirds scoreless innings now for him consecutive. He gave one run early in the year, nothing since. He does not want to talk about it. They do not want to talk about it. I understand why that's the case, but we need to talk about how good he has been in just lights out stuff from a veteran who has been a successful reliever in the past. He struggled in Minnesota last year. The Nats signed him as a a good bounce back candidate. And boy, has it made a difference to have him in addition to Harvey and Finnegan at the end of games. That turned out to be a great signing to this point. Harvey, of course, has been very good all along. And Finnegan had not pitched in a week because every game had been more lopsided, both in terms of losses or wins. His last appearance was that game that he blew in Philadelphia. It was really good to see him come right back and just bam, 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 one, two, three, including a strikeout of the first batter he faced. So no drama in the ninth, just like we had seen from him for more than a month. So good all around. And I understand the Mariners are struggling right now offensively. They had a team meeting after this game, by the way. That's how where things are right now with Seattle. But big props to the Nats pitching so far the first two games of this series. And honestly, this is just a continuation of what they've been doing now for quite a while. It In a bigger picture, I did not see the Nats pitching staff being as good as it's been. I thought they had good pitchers on the staff, but top to bottom, with only a few exceptions, they have been outstanding And that is such an unexpected and pleasant development through the first almost now one third of the season. I brought this up on the show for Saturday morning. I want to get your take on this. Dylan Floro has been so good. I know we rarely see non-closer relievers make all-star teams, but Floro's pitching to the tune of an ERA less than half of an earned run average. 0.35 now is your Dylan Floro ERA 
for this regular season. He has thrown five and two thirds more innings than Finnegan has. I mean, you do the compare and contrast. Finnegan, 180 ERA, whip is 0.9, 14 to 16 on saves. Floro, 0.35 ERA, whip of 0.97. Now, yes, Finnegan has appeared in more high leverage spots, but do you think it's possible that Floro, a quote unquote middle innings reliever, could make an all star team with the kind of excellence that he's putting forth this season? You know, it happens from time to time. I feel like maybe more so in recent years than it used to where, you know, if you're going to take a reliever, it's based on their saves and hardly anything else. I do think you have more of a chance for someone like that to make it nowadays. Really, though, it boils down to what kind of arms does a manager in the All-Star game want to have late? And I feel like they're going to lean towards power arms for that as opposed to a ground ball guy as good as he's been. No question he's been really good. But I think especially if you're just talking about one member of the team representing them in the All-Star game, it might be a tough sell to get Dylan Thor. Not that he hasn't pitched well enough to earn it, but if Finnegan keeps this up, I think he's got a strong case. And because it's a power arm that if you're the manager of that game, you want somebody that can come in and throw 100 against the All-Stars from the American League, my hunch would be if they have a reliever go as of right now. A lot can change. I think as of right now, you'd take Finnegan over Floro. Yeah. The run prevention has been spectacular, though, from Floro. Uh, I give that guy nice. a lot of credit. When Meg Smith's son couldn't stay warm in the hospital, she designed fleece ponchos that kept him warm and wouldn't interfere with his IV lines. Now, Meg donates ponchos made with fun fleece fabrics to other hospitalized children through an all-volunteer nonprofit. Cape Ivy is a D.C. area charity that has donated over 18,000 ponchos across the country to keep kids warm in memory of Meg's son. Check out their website, capeivy.org. For each $10 donation, a child receives a poncho. That's C-A-P-E-I-V-Y dot org. Prize Picks is America's number one fantasy sports app with more than 5 million members. It's the most fun and exciting way to get in on the action while you watch your favorite sports and players. You just pick more or less on two or more player stats for your shot to win up to 100 times your cash. I made my first $10 deposit and received an instant $10 bonus. And if you have the skills, you can play for a shot of turning your $10 into $1,000. And playoff time is the best time to join the Prize Picks community of over 5 million members who have already downloaded the app. Prize Picks is available in more than 30 states across the country, including California, Texas, and Georgia. Download the app today and use the code BLUEWIRE for a first deposit match up to $100. That's a first deposit match of up to $100 when you download the app and use the code BLUEWIRE. Prize Picks. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. James Wood did not play on Saturday for the second straight day as Rochester lost 6-3 to the Lehigh Valley Iron Pigs. Wood was removed due to hamstring tightness on Thursday and has yet to return to the lineup. Now back to the show. Robles, the pinch runner at third. Ruiz at first. One out, bottom of the seventh, tied at one. Ruiz runs. Vargas hits it on the ground towards short. Crawford charges. He'll throw to first. Coming in to score on the play is Robles. An RBI ground out for the pinch hitter Vargas in the Nationals lead 2-1. to one. All right, so the Nats offense in this uh, 3-1 win over the Mariners. Look, the Nats are not a very good offensive team. We get that. But like we said, when you pitch to the level that the Nats have been pitching, you don't have to have great offense. And uh, the Nats ended up having enough offense on Saturday. Three runs, six hits, no walks. You know, the walks have kind of dried up with the Nats lately. They're not drawing walks like they had been. But three for seven with runners in scoring position. You break down the six hits, one double. 
and five singles. And that scored one run in the bottom of the second, two runs in the bottom of the seventh. We'll get to some standout individual performances, but what you hit on earlier in the show, the uh, managerial chess game that uh, we saw in this game, and uh, Davey Martinez putting on a masterclass with what he pulled off in the bottom of the seventh. You laid this out well in your story on MassInSports.com. What especially stuck out to you? So part of this is what Scott Service did in his pitching decisions. But Davey Martinez, it seems like, was prepared exactly for this scenario and knew what he wanted to do and then was able to implement it perfectly. So the scenario is you've got one out and Jesse Winker singles to start the inning. He steals second. Cabert Ruiz now with a bloop single. And they've got first and third with one out and Nick Senzel coming up. Nick Senzel, as we know, has really been struggling for them. Aside from that one week where he went off hitting home runs, he really has not done hardly anything for them. And the Mariners have a lefty in the game at this point in Spire. And Scott Service comes out to the mound and he calls for the righty. And I immediately think to myself, you just help Davey out because he now has a reason to pinch hit Vargas for Senzel. And even though it's a platoon thing, lefty, righty, and all that, if you know the team, if you've been following them at all, who do you trust more to get a guy home from third in that situation, Nick Senzel or Ildemaro Vargas? It's Vargas 99 times out of 100. So you've now played right into his hands and you've got the guy he'd rather have up to bat. The only thing you worry about there is hitting him in a double play. But what did they do to avoid that? They have Cabert Ruiz, the runner on first, the slowest guy on the team, one of only two players on the team that has not stolen a base yet this year. You put him in motion. And he's running on the pitch, not to steal second, but to stay out of a double play. And what happens? Vargas hits a little roller to short. There's only one play at first, and that lets the runner score. Props to Davey. He had it mapped out what he wanted to do, but Scott Service did not do his homework. And he decided to go with a lefty-righty matchup, not realizing that he was actually bringing a better hitter to the plate in that situation than if he had just stuck with who he had and would have faced Nick Senzel instead. It's so funny. I mean, if you spend like five minutes on baseball reference, you could figure out rather quickly that Ildemaro Vargas <laughs> has been one of the Nats best batters this season. But, you know, I think there's a larger point with Davey, and that is he is doing a really good job this season. Like there are always going to be nits to pick with any manager. And, you know, we have our complaints. And, you know, I, I've talked about Joy Manessis so frequently batting in the upper portion of Nats lineups. But like, Bigger picture, Davey is doing a really good job with this team. That this team is getting every last possible drop from this pitching staff is a credit to Davey and his staff in addition to the pitchers. And this offense, as limited as it is, that Davey is getting whatever he's getting out of it, I think is a testament to Davey and the job that he's doing. And, uh, you know, I know that, hey, the record doesn't overwhelm you. The run differential doesn't overwhelm you. But I don't think that those things speak to the job that Davey's doing. He's doing one of his better managing jobs. I mean, you can't top 2019, of course. But after that, I think you could make a case what we're seeing so far this season is, I guess you would say, the second best managerial season for Davey Martinez, at least so far. Yeah, I think it's easy to make that case because I think you have to look at who he has to work with. He's had more talented teams, obviously. But what I give him so much credit for is he realized pretty early on what this team was and what this team was not. And how do you get the most out of what you have? We know they're not going to outslug you. So he says, okay, you know what? We're going to run the bases better than anybody else. I don't care who it is. We're going to put in motion. Even Cabert Ruiz, we're going to put in motion to put pressure on the other team and give us a better chance of scoring that run. So understanding your personnel, using them to their fullest ability, I get it. There are times you say, well, he's still playing Robles or he's still batting Manessis in the middle of the lineup. Okay, I get it. He only has what he has to work with right now. Would it be different if he had James Wood and uh, healthy Lane Thomas and eventually Dylan Cruz and who knows who else? Yeah. But all he can do is work with what he has. And I think he has found a way to maximize what he can get out of these guys. Doesn't always work out, of course. And there are times you say, man, Gallo's at the plate again with the game on the line. This is the last guy you want. Although he came through in this game with an RBI single. Yes, single for Joey Gallo in a big spot for the insurance run. But I do give Davey a lot of credit. I think he did a nice job of understanding what he had 
available to him and now trying to maximize what he can get from those guys. What happened with Gallo was pretty comical. He and that Nats two-run seventh has a two-out first pitch RBI single to right field for a 3-1 Nats lead. Great to see that. And then he gets picked off and caught stealing second base for the third out. What the heck is Joey Gallo doing (laughs) getting picked off like that? No excuse for that one. Maybe he was just still stunned at the fact that he actually had an RBI single for them. And it was an RBI because who scored from second on that hit? Cabert Ruiz, the slowest guy on the team, barely getting in ahead of the throw. So like I said, they are squeezing everything they can out of these guys, especially when it comes to on the bases. And for Gallo, that was his first RBI, Al. I know you're a big RBI guy. First RBI since April 15th, okay? That is a month and 10 days. I know he was hurt for some of that time. A month and 10 days without an RBI for a guy who in theory is supposed to be your big slugger. And I believe I need to go back and look. That may have been his first RBI on an on-home run this year. RBI may be an overrated stat, but in that case, I think RBI tells an accurate story. You mentioned K. Barrett Ruiz. This is now multiple games in which he is showing signs of life. I am starting to get encouraged by what we're seeing from K. Baird. He on Saturday as an ad starting catcher and number six batter, two for two with a double, a single, and an RBI sack fly. He and the Nats, one run second, had an RBI sack fly for a one nothing Nats lead. He in the bottom of the fifth had a leadoff full count opposite field double to the left center field gap. And k in that Nats, two run seventh, a one-out single on a fly ball to shallow left center field on a one-two pitch. He has been better lately. He has had some extra base hits lately. And maybe, just maybe, he is getting going. The sample size of him being better is starting to grow here a bit. Yeah, and I think it's not just the results, but just the way it looks, hitting the ball with more authority. I know that last single, which was critical, was a a blooper in the center field, but the double, he drove to left center field. We know he homered the other night. I think it's something like four of his last seven hits have been for extra bases. So all that added up, I think, is, is showing you better signs. He's not there yet. He's not all the way back to who he needs to be, but from really at a low point about a week to 10 days ago, I think it was, that we were talking about this guy looks lost at the plate. He looks a lot better and trending in the right direction at last. And boy, do they need that. So that's been good to see. And nice to see that he can help them out, not just with his bat, but with his legs as well. Not the characteristic we typically think of Cabert Ruiz contributing to a win. The other Nat with a multi-hit game on Saturday, Jesse Winker. He has the Nat starting left fielder and number five batter, two for three with two singles. Now, he did leave the game due to cramping up. He in the two-run seventh had a one-out single up the middle and to steal a second base. He in the Nats one-run second had a bunt single. I want to ask you this. Was that, in fact, a sacrifice bunt that turned into a single? The Nats had Luis Garcia Jr. on second and nobody out. Garcia had an infield single and then a steal of second base. Did Davey have Winker bunting for a sacrifice in that spot, or was that a bunt for a hit? Because it obviously ended up being a bunt for a hit. So I didn't ask about this afterwards. It was kind of lost in the shuffle. But watching it live, to me, that looked absolutely like a bunt for a hit. It was a drag bunt by a left-handed batter just trying to push it past the pitcher's mound. So if it was supposed to be a sacrifice, it was actually a poor job of that because he bunted it way harder than you would normally expect. I think he was bunting for a hit there. So again, not on my bingo card normally. Jesse Winker drag bunt single. He pulled it off and talking about guys running the bases hard, he does that. He steals a base in the seventh. Now he ends up getting pinch run for by Victor Robles after he cramped up, I guess, running the bases. Davey made it sound like that's just a case of it was a really hot, muggy day. It finally got to him. He thinks he'll be fine for Sunday. We'll have to see. But Jesse Winker, another guy who (laughs) you think you have this image in your mind of who he is and who he's supposed to be. And he's playing like a very different guy. And I give him all the credit in the world. He's bought into what they're trying to do here. And he's trying to make himself a part of that, even if it doesn't necessarily look natural for his style of play. Nats win this game despite the top three batters in their lineup. C.J. Abrams, Eddie Rosario, and Joey Manessis going a combined 0 for 11 with five strikeouts, no walks. Abrams 0 for 4 with a strikeout. Rosario 0 for 4 with three strikeouts. But the Nats do come away with the win. From groan-worthy dad jokes to patching up skin knees, your dad is one of a kind. This Father's Day, give him a gift that is guaranteed to take him to his happy place, Omaha Steaks. Order mouth-watering gift packages starting at just $89 when you go to omahasteaks.com 
and use promo code NASHAT at checkout. Each package is backed by their unconditional money-back guarantee. Show your dad the love he deserves with a gift as unforgettable as he is. Visit omahasteaks.com, promo code NASHAT at checkout. Outfield straight away, and the pitch swung on, hit in the air to right center field, playable for Rodriguez. He waits under it, he makes the catch for the out, tagging from third is Garcia. He'll come in to score as the throw goes into second base. K. Bert Ruiz with a sacrifice fly to drive in his 11th run of the year, and the Nationals are on the board here in the bottom of the second inning with one out. It's Washington one and Seattle nothing. So far, a really good weekend for the Nats, and we also had some other news with the Nats on Saturday. Kate Cavalli, a uh, second rehab start Saturday morning in West Palm Beach, Florida, doing quite well against Nats minor leaguers. Four innings, eight strikeouts on just 47 pitches. Uh, what do you make of what happened there, and uh, what is next for Cade Cavalli in his comeback from Tommy John surgery? I mean, that sounds great. Now, it was a little bit of a weird situation. The first game he pitched in was in the Florida Complex League against, I think it was the Astros team. This one, the team had the day off, and so this was an intra-squad game instead. So I don't know what it looked like necessarily from a competitive standpoint, but obviously he's overwhelming the hitters at that level with eight strikeouts and that efficient in four innings. Averaging 95 miles an hour with his fastball, that's all great. What I'm curious to see now is, you know, he looks healthy. He's starting to build the arm up. He's having some success. Can you get him up to a higher level of competition? Because he needs to start actually pitching against guys who may have a chance of doing something against him. They're still making that decision if he's going to stay down there once more, or maybe they would move him up to, say, Fredericksburg, Wilmington, somewhere uh, that lines up with his schedule. But he's on a five-day schedule now. Everything, by all accounts, is going very well. And like we said, the countdown began Last week when he made that first appearance, the 30-day window for rehab, and you'd hope at the end of all this, we're seeing him now make his return to the big leagues. So when his minor league rehab assignment really kicks into gear with a stint at, you know, double-A, triple-A, do we have any sense on how many starts he'll need, or do you just have to see how things are going before you arrive at a number of minor league starts that are needed? Yeah, I think it's, how does he feel? How much is the arm built up in terms of both pitches and innings? And at some point, what are the results? You know, because even if he's healthy and even if he's throwing 85 pitches in a game, if he's getting hit around or he's walking a lot of guys, you don't have to make the move yet. The unique thing about his situation is even when the 30 days are up, they could say, we're activating you off the I.L., but then we're optioning you to Rochester where he may be already. It's a procedural move more than anything. But he has the ability to still just be a minor leaguer, a healthy minor leaguer, before they make the move to call him up. Now, I think they would love for him to be pitching well enough at the end of all this to say, yeah, you're ready. We're bringing you up to the big leagues. But they have that out if they need it. Will he use the full 30 days? I'm guessing it'll be somewhere close to that. But again, it depends on, first of all, how's he feel? Second of all, has he built up enough to say, okay, you're ready to really start a big league game, even though, of course, they'll watch his workload once he's up here. And then the third part of it, I do think you have to have some success. I know results are not everything, but this isn't spring training. It does need to have some kind of competitive aspect to it, because if you're going to put him in your big league rotation, especially the way these guys are pitching right now, you want him to be able to have a chance to be halfway decent. You don't want him up here and saying, well, it's all right if he throws his 85 pitches, but gives up five, six runs, no big deal. No, they're trying to win games. So you do want that to at least be part of the equation. And what you described potentially continuing the quote unquote minor league rehab assignment by optioning the guy in a procedural move. That's what the Nats did with Stone Garrett. So, I mean, they have done that. They could do that conceivably with Cade Cavalli, but we shall see. Uh, this installment of the Nats Chat Podcast brought to us by Cape Ivy, a D.C. area charity that has donated over 18,000 ponchos to keep kids warm. Visit CapeIvy.org for more information. So the Nats have a shot at a three-game sweep of the Seattle Mariners. Game three of this series at Nationals Park, Sunday afternoon, 135. Patrick Corbin will be the Nats starter. The Nats have uh, pushed back the next start of Mitchell Parker. Not shocking. You brought this up not long ago, the idea of them monitoring his workload for this season. Are there other guys you think that the Nats are monitoring workloads for this season, like Jake Irvin, 
Mackenzie Gore? Or do you think we're kind of relaxing on those guys in terms of being super concerned about workloads? I think as we get further along, they may find some opportunities to maybe do something like that with both of them, with Gore and Irvin. I remember thinking that they're going to kind of try to treat Gore this year like they did Josiah Gray last year. And for the most part, he was good to go. I think at the very end, right, he had something. So I I don't think they want to have to do that, but they'll watch it knowing that he's still young and still kind of building the arm up. Jake Irvin threw a whole lot more last year than he ever had as a professional, certainly. And he's been in the rotations from day one this year. So yeah, if there's an opportunity, maybe give him one extra day off, something like that. Once we get around to the all-star break, they can finagle things, give guys extra days around that too. So I think they'll look at that, but I don't, I think they feel like they're in a pretty good place with both of them. That last year was an important building block for them to get to a certain number that they now can expand on this year. And ideally, as long as there's no health issues, I think the hope would be they both can make 30 starts without too much disruption. Yeah, the issue for Mackenzie Gore last season left finger blisters. So it's not even, you know, that that was like, you know, a shoulder or an elbow or something like that. Uh, left finger blisters. You tell us what you think. Hit us up on X at Nats underscore chat. You can email the show Nats chat podcast at gmail.com. Uh, you can find us on our website, Nats chat podcast dot com, at which you can purchase a Nats chat podcast T-shirt. All Nationals radio highlights on Nats chat are courtesy of of 1067 The Fan. That chat is on the radio Sunday morning 9 to 10 on ESPN Richmond, which is 106.1 FM in the Richmond, Virginia area, and Sunday morning 9 to 10 on Priority Sports Radio 94.1 in the Virginia Beach area. For Mark Zuckerman, I'm Al Galdi. We thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you next time on the Nats Chat Podcast. Everyone is talking about magnesium. It's all you hear about. But why? What do we know about magnesium? Well, magnesium is the number one mineral that 75% of Americans are deficient in. If you are a woman over 35, magnesium will help you rediscover balance, energy, and vitality. Magnesium supports more than 300 enzymatic reactions in your body, including those involved in hormonal balance. From functional medicine doctors to mental well-being and female hormone experts, we all know that magnesium is the one mineral to improve all aspects of well-being and health. But which one? Magnesium Breakthrough from Bioptimizers. The trusted choice recommended by leading experts with seven best-absorbed forms of magnesium to ensure your body receives the support it needs for overall well-being. Go to bioptimizers.com balance today and use code BALANCE10 for 10% off. Support your journey to wellness at B-I-O-P-T-I-M-I-Z-E-R-S dot com forward slash balance. Magnesium Breakthrough from Bioptimizers, your foundation to optimal health and vitality.